the hidden economics of PERS. Again, the first time for Asian perspective, a topic about numbers and economics. Let me introduce to you Dr. Dennis DePetri. I'm very happy to be with you today. Uh, this is my first visit to Vietnam, although I've been to Thailand and Malaysia, uh, to South Korea, and I do claim that I've been to China, but only transiting through the airport uh, on my way somewhere else. So I'll have an opportunity soon to be in China for a couple of days and meet pig producers, so I'm very excited about that. Because from where we sit in the United States, we look at what you're doing in Asia and we're humbled by the dramatic volume of production that takes place in this part of the world. And so when we think about you, we think of uh, all the tremendous work uh, in feeding people that's going on over here and we salute you certainly in that, that endeavor. So you can tell by looking at me that not only have I spent my whole career studying food, but I'm also a consumer of food, right? And so whenever I look at the economics of uh, the pork chain, I'm always looking at both at the production level and how it translates into food. Because the ultimate goal of all pork production is to provide food for others, not to create jobs, not to use corn, right? Not to make manure for some other purposes. These all happen, but the ultimate thing is to make food. And so it's a very noble endeavor and one that I have been proud to be a part of for 30 years and salute the work that you do here. Well, I wanna begin by challenging you with the idea that a revolution is coming in our industry. And I'm going to lead you through the reasons I believe that's happening. Because we had a very tranquil period in the production of uh, pigs from about 1930 till about 1985, where prices, both for pigs and for feed, uh, feed grains, were very flat and very predictable. But things have changed, and things are not going back to the way they were. And in order to be successful in the coming time, and when I'm hired by a farm, and I work for primarily the largest production systems in North America as well as in Europe and, and in other places, when I'm consulted, it's to try to ensure that the firm will be ready for the kinds of challenges, that they'll be resilient to the revolution which is coming. So what are the dynamics of that revolution? First of all, it's not that more people will be coming first, but it's because of the tremendous increase in per capita income that we have rising demand for meat, right? The very poor normally do not consume uh, a diet of meat, but as we see the uh, revolution in manufacturing and development, for instance in Asia, and the poor are leaving rural areas and coming to the cities and having income to spend, they upgrade the diet uh, to meat. And even though we're at a moment in the world where we're having a slowdown in, in the progression of income growth, it's transient. And the growth in production uh, required to supply this increasing demand will create the tremendous opportunity for the future but will you be ready uh, to make that happen? Because in spite of the fact that more will be demanded, we're facing more and more volatility in the prices of feedstuffs and in the prices of pigs, right? And we're gonna work our way through some of that and what that means and how we have to change our mindset away from the current way we conceive of the productivity of a farm to understand the new complexity which is coming uh, with volatility, not only to succeed, 
but to understand the use of, um, of various inputs and to understand the impact of diseases like PERS. We can expect to face the temporary unavailability of certain key inputs uh, in the world because so much of the global economy now requires the importation and the exportation. Uh, we're not self, very few countries are self-sufficient in everything they need. So once you're depending on the importation of feedstuffs or even key uh, pharmaceuticals or nutrients for the animal, as well as dependent on the exportation of meat in order to provide income, once you've set your economy to depend on those things, we know they can be disturbed, both for political reasons, for uh, uh, weather and climate reasons. We have a major drought in the part of the, uh, the area, and so the area which normally supplies feed to you no longer has it. You know, how do you set yourself up to be able to be resilient in these times? Again, import-export market disruptions and closures can happen. And we know that governments throughout the world provide subsidies which make it seem very profitable and easy to produce pigs, but then they suddenly remove them. And just when you've been used to receiving the benefit of all these things, now you have to be on your own again. And in making that transition, uh, if you anticipate this coming and you don't become uh, lazy or dependent on outside help, then you'll be ready when those kinds of things disappear. So, a revolution is coming. Will you be ready? Uh, it's bringing unprecedented opportunity, but unprecedented risks. And here's the problem at the farm and why most people are not ready for the revolution which is coming. First of all, the tremendous advance that we made in the swine industry to bring scale uh, to farms happened because we begin to understand that if you move animals together, age segregated, from the sow farm early while they're still under the protective immunity of the sow to a separate site and keep the group fairly tight, you see, uh, then you could break disease uh, challenges, some disease challenges, and you could then build larger farms because you didn't have catastrophic disease outcomes all the time from mixing pigs from many different sites. Once we were able to achieve that, farms suddenly exploded in size uh, because uh, uh, they were capable of doing it and new investment came in. But with that tremendous scale, we moved away from the individual understanding of pigs and treated what was in the barn as a group. And once we began to do that, we began to underestimate the variation which was in the barn because we understood it only by the mean, right? And by understanding or misunderstanding the level of the variation, we misunderstand the requirements uh, to create the most value from the pigs that are in the barn. So we have an over-reliance of the mean for bioeconomic data, not only when we're looking at how we set the farm for production. For instance, we bring pigs into a barn and we send one diet for a period of time, which is meant to have the nutrient profile on average for all the pigs that are in the barn. And as the pigs grow, we know from observation and from measurement that in the United States, when the first pigs are sold from a finishing barn, and these are healthy pigs, we can have a weight range from the smallest pigs to the largest pigs in the barn of as much as 40 to 50 kilograms. And we're sending one diet for a few weeks, which is supposed to be the nutrition to cover all of that. We, we set the temperature in the barn and the level of ventil ventilation for the average animal in the barn, though the variation of the animals is, is large. 
right? So what happens is by understanding the animals only as a mean, we are systematically wasting resources and doing very imprecise production. But we made that sacrifice in order to have scale. But I'm telling you, volatility in input costs and in pork prices will force us back to more precision. See, uh, wasting is never good, but it's not as economically significant when prices are stable, right? If you have a very predictable pig price, a very predictable feed price, and you're making money, then we don't worry so much if we're off a little bit with the diet here and there, even though we're frequently off a lot. I can tell you by, by working day in and day out with some of the most sophisticated production people around the world, I'll ask them, what weight do you sell your pig? And in the U.S., they may say, our farm, we sell at 125 kilograms. And then I pull out the data from the slaughterhouse, which gives them individual animal weights. And the average is indeed about 125. But do you know that only 15% of the animals are actually within 5 kilograms of that mean on either side? Right? But in their mind, they're thinking all of the animals are going out at 125 kilograms, when in fact it's a very big difference. So the pathway to additional precision must go through the, vari uh, the variance or the standard deviation. So now if I come to your farm and I say, how many litters per sow per year do you have? And you give me a number the mean, I'll ask, what is the standard deviation? And you must know this if I come to your farm, all right? Or we sit down and have a big lecture, right? <laughs> if I ask you what your feed efficiency is, all right, over time, you'll tell me the top 20% performance of your farm <laughs> over the last six months. But I want to know what is the standard deviation, at least of the averages that you've collected, uh, knowing that you are not able to produce it for individual barns. So we also have a dramatic increase in the movement of animals. I was to, able to come from the very center of the United States to Vietnam in 22 hours, in less than one day. And because people and animals and food move around the globe very freely, you can expect the introduction of new virus types and subtypes very quickly. Once you get homogenization done, Dr. Gillespie, then here comes the next person on a plane, which is bringing uh, your, your uh, job security for the next uh, five years, right? <laughs> OK. Let's talk about the mindsets of production that are occurring around the globe and how we have to be open to new mindsets. Now, I used to be able to say that I could spend 10 minutes with the head of a farm and be able to tell you the mindset of the farm because they use certain key words and an outlook about what they're doing that becomes very predictable. So let me tell you or share with you how that's changed and I ask you to think about what is your mindset today. The first one is the mindset of pig production. Do you consider yourself a pig producer? Well, what is a pig producer? Well, a pig producer focuses on individual animals. You know, a lot of times they have a name, right? <laughs> uh, we're thinking of individual animals. Uh, we're thinking of small farms, right? We're thinking of individual pigs. And these farms are characterized by not keeping records, right? They can't tell you anything about their productivity or efficiency. The only record they may keep is for the taxing authority, and usually it's in a shoebox up in the closet, so when the taxing authority comes, they dump it all out, and it's too intimidating for the tax authority to go through, so they leave and 
say, you know, you're okay, right? <laughs> well, that mindset gave way, at least in North America in the 1980s, to what I claim to call meat production. What is the difference between pig production and meat production? No longer did people tell you the number of pigs they produced, but they used terms like throughput, and they tell you the number of kilograms, kilograms per square meter of concrete that pass through their farm, right? Because the focus then becomes scale. And instead of the individual animals now, too many to name, right? Uh, just a sea of production and the focus is on meat. I once heard a veterinarian tell a group of other veterinarians that the number one goal of any farm is the least cost production of lean muscle tissues. Now, as a consumer, I was very frightened by this, right? <laughs> because I don't eat lean muscle tissue, right? Uh, in fact, one of my most favorite dishes in uh, Vietnam so far is the very small sausages, which are sweet, you know, which are about 75% fat. I thought if we're making only lean muscle tissue, we're not talking about food anymore. We're talking about an industrial process. Okay? Well, what we found out was if you do that, while you can produce lots of it, there are limitations on demand. And what we found out in the United States was, if I could come to Japan and understand what Japan wants, instead of our lean muscle tissue, which we make cheaply, we understand that the Japanese, for instance, just for instance, want a very precise color in the meat. Not just meat, but meat with a color, and meat which has been trimmed in certain ways that match the specifications for their traditional cooking and dishes. So the mindset went next from just lowering cost. This is about lowering cost only, and there are limits to it because we wind up with overproduction of low cost, low value meat. Now we focus on the income side and say, how do we gain more income for, for our production? We must do it by a focus on food. So now we begin to think, how does each culture want to break down the carcass? You may be interested to know that wherever you go around the world, even though we think everyone eats the pork the way we do, Right? Uh, if you look and if you ask, you'll find that there's a very different fabrication of the carcass in major cultures around the world that supports the traditional cooking style. And not only is it a matter of color and size of the cut, but also the place where the knife or the uh, cleaver cuts, right? So I noticed at the dinner last night when we had the duck that there was no paying attention to the joints of the animal, right? Just whack, 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 whack. Which is great, which is fine. But in the United States, poultry is cut between each of the joints, not just chopped. Right? So every culture has its own way of doing things, and people will pay more if you provide them what they want. Well, what comes after food production? In the case of food production, it's visible in the meat. That is, it's cut in a certain way. It has a certain color. It has a certain amount of fat inside that is visible. But the new thing which is coming across, uh, coming to pass in the world, is the development of attributes for food. And these attributes cannot be visually seen in the meat, right? 
They're attributes that have to be assured by branding. And what are some of them? Well, like no antibiotics were used, for instance. You can't visually look at the meat and say, ah, I see the one where no antibiotics was used, right? You have to make an assurance. You have to believe the label on the packaging. What else? Organic. How do you like my frog jumping in like that? This is uh, rainforest certified, so the rainforest was not disturbed. Grown outside, not in buildings. You see the proliferation of types of assurances that people want about food now. And the willingness to pay for food with attributes is growing. So, what matters in this time of upheaval and change, and what matters for you to become resilient, regardless of where your production is in that four-part progression uh, of mindsets, is you must establish long-term, low-variance profitability, preferably greater than industry average profitability, uh, in order to be successful in the future. And so we're going to focus on these now as we look at an economic analysis of PERS, which will be quite different probably than most analysis that you're, the way you would think through as a, uh, as a, a typical person making analysis in, about the use, for instance, of, of vaccine. Anything which threatens this, and each piece is very important, uh, must be overcome. So now we're going to look at the impact, the risk impact, with a very simple but powerful economic model that shows the relationship between the things you're examining on the farm and the final economic outcome, and how those things change uh, when you uh, uh, have a disease on the farm or when you're able to prevent it. So, here is how, for instance, average daily gain, ADG, is a typical metric on the farm which is affected by PERS or by disease. You saw in the previous paper how the gain, the rate of gain of the animal slows. And I'm, I'm going to make some assumptions about that. And yet, I'm going to use this as the first example to illustrate a point, but it has the same meaning in feed efficiency, in death loss, and so on. So, we know from the literature, if you want to pick some ranges, that if your farm is producing an average daily gain at sale point of 850 grams, maybe with PERS, that drops to... 725. But this picture illustrates how production people think of that drop from one growth rate for all the animals down to a new growth rate for all the animals. But what is actually going on in the building? Do you ever visualize it like this? That every pig in the barn, if you have 1,000 pigs in the barn, Every pig is growing at a different rate, right? And the average just happens to be some measure near the middle of that distribution. In fact, we have pigs that are growing much faster, and we have pigs that are growing much slower. And biologically, typically, the shape of the growth distribution is not normal, but is slid to the right for the left for you, right? I told the translator that if I knew how to do it, I would moonwalk to the left to illustrate what happens next, right? Because when this changes, what happens to this distribution? Something like this. Notice how the shape has changed. We have a longer tail. You see, moving toward the left. 
and the frequency of the better growing pigs has dropped. Now, how many of you think of your pigs this way when you think of average daily gain dropping? You see, if you begin to make the transition in your thinking that this is what's happening in the barn, you will begin to be ready for the age where precision is going to become critical to your economic success rather than uh, the age of averages, which is ending. Now, it could also be this, right? Because Dr. Gillespie mentioned how we may have subpopulations of animals in the building which are almost unaffected by the virus, and then sick ones. So we have what's referred to as a bimodal distribution, where the mean is not so important as the two modes in trying to understand what's going to happen eventually in the barn if I treat these animals or don't treat these animals, or, for instance, the consequence economically if I've decided not to vaccinate and this happens. See, most people, when they are doing the economic analysis for vaccination, they say, well, if all of my pigs were growing at 850 and all of my pigs then fell to 725 times the current market price, times the current cost of feed, and we all know that your next group of pigs will not face the current cost of feed or the current market price or the average growth rate. Correct? So we need to change our thinking to these kinds of things. You can't manage what you're not measuring or at least visualizing well in the barn. So we have an imprecise response frequently to a very precise problem. So here's the model we're going to use to look at all the possible outcomes that may be occurring in the barn when we decide the economic impact of disease and the mitigation of it through, say, vaccination. We start with the universally accepted metric of economic performance for a business, which is the net return per unit invested in the farm. So whether it's an RMB or a Vietnamese dong or US dollar, what is my net return that is money left over after all costs are paid for each dollar or unit of investment I've made to create that income. Now, that's a very good and accepted way globally to understand the economic performance of a farm, but if I'm your economist and I come to you and I say, your return on investment has fallen 12%, you say, well, why? Tell me more. So far, I, this gives me no insight, does it? This just says it went down, but it doesn't say why. So a very ingenious man by the name of DuPont about 60 or 75 years ago found a way mathematically to disaggregate this very simple formula into three parts. And he called the first one asset turnover, the middle one net profit margin, and the third one leverage is a measure of how much money you borrow, right? And what I'm gonna do for you now is to map the typical production metrics which you look at every day into this model, and then we're gonna show what happens when disease happens. Now, the interesting part of this model is that there is a mathematical equation for this, this, and this. And if you multiply all three of them together, they collapse into return on investment. So it's a simple disaggregation mathematically, but into pieces which are very different and which give us an action plan. So asset turnover. What is meant by asset turnover? Asset turnover is nothing about profit. It's about whether the things which you have bought on your farm are fully employed and working to create income. Or did you make a building which is half empty? 
then asset turnover slows down. Or if you have a pig which should be growing at 850 grams, now at 700, right? So that slowing of the growth will slow the money coming into the, into the business. So the asset turnover says, not profit, but just money coming in from sales. Do you have money which is like a fire hose coming in, or money like you're watering flowers? Right? That's the question here. Net profit margin. We're interested in money coming in, but if the money comes in, and then we write checks and the money goes out, then we've been busy, but we haven't created a busyness. Right? I don't know how that works in Chinese and Vietnam and all that, but it's a great little English twist of words there. All right, it's the heartbeat of the farm. It says, all right, for every dollar which comes into the farm, how much stays, drops into my pocket, and how much goes out to the feed dealer, to the slaughter, or to the uh, truckers, to the labor, whatever. And then the last one is leverage. And the idea here is that the first two are working good, make it bigger if you can. If the first two are not working, make it smaller and don't waste global resources. Okay, let's map our metrics in here. These are the common metrics that are asset turnover metrics, right? So the wean to service interval, breeding herd mortality, non-productive days, nursery death loss, average gain, daily gain. These are all measures of is the farm turning pigs out at the right rate and creating money coming back to me. What happens when Oh, let's look at the other side. These are the key metrics for profit. So these are the cost metrics, like the amount I spend for veterinary medicine, feed, feed efficiency, market prices, and so on. So these are the metrics which are important to profit, how much stays in the farm of each dollar which comes in. So now we're gonna get rid of borrowing because if we had a whole day seminar, then I'd talk about all three. But since I have 45 minutes, we only talk about two. So we'll get rid of that, talk about each individually. Asset turnover, remember, measures how much money is flowing into the farm. And if I have PERS, what happens? These things primarily in the finishing are affected. The death loss, the average daily gain, the market weight achieved in the number of days that's normal, and the days, total days in wean to finish to reach my target weight. If I allow PERS to infect my farm, then the profit which comes in of the dollars which are coming in is now small. So the money comes in, but it goes out to wasted feed, to veterinary bills, to medicine, and so on. And these are the things which are affected on the profit side. If I choose to prevent uh, disease, or vaccinate as a prevention against this, what happens is, now we speed up the process and more dollars fall, fall in. Okay? Now, I want to also illustrate that instead of individual means, we know that each element of asset turnover is really a distribution over time, which is often reported as a mean to you, but we want to start asking for the standard deviation also. And a change in one of them, like an increase in the variance, and then a decrease 
in the profit margin now gets translated up into the return on investment. So this traces how as you affect each one of these, it traces into your long-term performance. Now, remember the key thing you must achieve in the coming revolution, long-term, low variance, return on investment. Anything which causes your investment return to be volatile will make lenders run from you and make your life miserable with respect to predictability. Okay, so even though you only get reported to you the mean, you need to start asking where it's possible to know for the standard deviation. <coughs> you need to become familiar with both the mean and the standard deviation for as many of these metrics where it can be measured. And right now that means typically the sow herd metrics because each of those flows into your performance on return on investment. So here's what it looks like practically. Here's the best pigs in Asia going, being loaded on a truck for market. And now they go to the slaughterhouse. Here are the ones which have disease. However, if I only look at the average weight sold, it could be that they're identical. But what is different? Days to achieve that weight. So if we wait long enough, we may get the barn to the target weight, but because the growth is slowed, now 12 more days to reach the same average weight, and so my building turns less each year because each turn takes longer, right? But if I'm only looking at average weight sold, I see no difference. So this is the, he the hidden economics to know the standard deviation of your metrics. Okay, we're gonna model this now in, in my conclusion. And I went to this set of literature which you'll see in my paper and I want to warn you that I have a little bit different result today that I'm going to show you than is in the book. <laughs> and the only reason is, you know at these big conferences, the people who uh, run the conferences, like my good friend Carlo here, sends me an email three months in advance and says, can we have your paper now so that we can be prepared? And then you send the paper and then you have three months to refine the concept and make the presentation. So sometimes there are changes which happen before, after you send the paper until you uh, make the final slides. But they're small and uh, they represent improvements. So for instance, if you go to the literature, you find out what happens when PERS outbreak happens is a reduction in consumption of feed. And that leads to a reduction in the growth rate. And if you survey the literature, you'll see that it can run from 1% to 2% reduction across all of nursery grow finish up to as much as 40%, depending on how dramatic the disease impact was. So now when, in the model that I'm creating, I'm not going to put in the average. That would be against everything that I've told you. I'm going to have the model look at a distribution of change in growth rate, which has a mean at the midpoint between these two ranges and reaches out and randomly selects a degraded growth rate every time the model comes through. And with the computer, we're going to make the farm operate 5,000 uses of the building through a whole production process more than 100 lifetimes for you. But we do this in order to get the full picture of all of the outcomes that are possible uh, from all of the combinations of market price. For instance, 
if I have PERS and I have a, a low growth rate when market prices are high and feed costs are low, this is a different outcome than if I have PERS when feed costs are high, market prices are low. You see? So we want to use what's called a stochastic model to examine all of the combinations of uh, big drop in uh, growth, small drop in growth, high prices, low prices, changes in feed efficiency, all sampled. By doing 5,000 samples, we actually get all combinations. From the literature, we see a deterioration in feed efficiency <coughs> from about 2 to 37 percent is the biggest one I could find. And so what happens is, when the animals get sick, they consume only for maintenance. They don't consume for growth. So they're eating feed but not growing. So the feed per kilogram of gain becomes much worse because it's all just from maintaining current size or even shrinking in some cases. Vet med costs. They increase as much as 60 percent and we use a baseline normal value of 265 in the finish for the, for the uh, model. And then we allow the model, when it comes by on one of the revolutions to turn the building, it looks at a distribution with mean 30 percent and at the extreme 60 percent increase in cost and zero increase in cost. So each time it comes through, it's going to randomly select in that distribution. Death loss from 1 to 15 percent. And again, we make this stochastic in the model that we're using. And depending on how you produce on your farm, if you have a set time where the pigs get 150 days and then they must go no matter what because the new ones are coming, then what happens with a slow growth rate is the pigs are lighter weight. If you have more flexibility when you can leave them into the barn to achieve a target weight, that's fine, but then they take more days and your barn turns slower, not as many times per year. So you can keep the turns the same, but lower the weight, or slow the turns and keep the weight the same. But either way, you have an economic loss. And then it's not so much in parts of Asia, but in many places of the world, there's discounts for very small pigs, very large pigs, pigs that are too fat, pigs that are too lean, and sickness can affect those things. So what I'm showing you here are the inputs for the model. The normal was 810 grams of growth. PERS impact was mean of 7% less, standard deviation of 1.5%. Feed efficiency, 2.65 kilograms per kilogram of gain, standard deviation. PERS, 15% deterioration at the mean with a standard deviation of 5%. Death loss, 3% per year is normal. Um, that can go up to 7% with a standard deviation 0.02 with PERS and then increase delta of vet med cost, remember, was as much as 60 percent. So we set the mean of the distribution at 30, and we truncate the distribution at 60 and 0, which this standard deviation will achieve for us. And then instead of using just today's feed cost, I built five rations, five diets for grow finish, and we use the distribution of the main feed cost ingredients, corn and soybean, over the last two years. So we're going to look in our sample at high cost feed, low cost feed, high cost pigs, low cost pigs, so on. Here is the result of the model, the baseline, the PERS impact, and I just draw your attention to the difference here in conclusion. And that is we have less income on average. Why? Because either lower weight pigs or fewer pigs to sell because of death loss and low gain. Increase in feed cost even with fewer pigs because feed efficiency has deteriorated. 
right? And we have the feed consumed by dead pigs, and there are more dead pigs here. The increase in vet med, decrease in total pigs marketed per year, from this amount to this amount. The turns of the buildings slow 0.16 from 256 to 240. 91 more dead animals per turn. And then profitability, which is return over feed cost, we lose $11,000 for each turn per head, about $11 per head uh, on average. And then remember our economic model, the DuPont equation, a 10% decline in asset turnover. Our wheel is turning 10% slower now, right? So now we've slowed the efficiency of the farm and made it unemploy resources and waste resources. Profit margin falls 12%. The net income falls 14%. Okay, this is a picture of the two distributions then of profit. The 5,000 replications in the model. So the red one is the normal one where you've prevented PERS by vaccination or were lucky and didn't get it if you didn't vaccinate. And then the blue one, I'm gonna moonwalk. You know, we're gonna slide to your left the whole distribution of outcomes moves to the left, meaning worse. And over time, although you may do very well a small number of times, most of the time, which is in the middle, you'll do less with the disease outcome. This is not a prescrip prescription for success in the new revolution which is coming. Here are the distributions of asset turnover, the wheel, and net profit margin, and they show the two distributions now of profitability. So in conclusion, we must have, in the coming challenging times, economic resiliency. Because respiratory diseases like PERS affect growth rate, feed conversion, vet costs, and death loss, key economic determinants of the success of the farm. And that increased death loss not only reduces total output, but it wastes scarce resources in your country that could be put to use for feeding the population. Prevention then becomes a form of, pre of precision. And why do I say that? Well, number one, it increases precision by lowering the variation in your outcome. Right? Number two, if you go into a building, and I've done this with many people that has, say, 500 or 1,000 animals, and I ask you to identify the half of the animals which are below the mean, walk through and try to do that sometime. You can't do it. You can see the one which is real small and has a broken leg, maybe, or a hairy coat but the one which is only 5% behind, you don't see this, but it's there, right? It's there taking money away from you all the time. And if you accelerate the decline of growth for that animal or that set of animals, not only does it take a long time to find out that something's wrong in your barn by visualizing enough change to see that we've had damage to the animals, but then there's a lag between treatment and recovery of the animal. And by the time this process is finished, when you treat after the fact, you've already permanently damaged some of the capacity of the animal. So prevention is much more effective. It raises expected net income and lowers the variance of net income over time. So let Asia emerge in the next 10 years as world leaders in long-term, low uh, variance, better than industry average net income, at least on your farm, by changing your mindset from means to precision in how you understand your production and your economic outcome. All right, I'm sick of myself, and there's coffee waiting, so I know you must be sick of me. So let's stop now, and thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Dr. DiPietri, no, we're not sick of you. And uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll still have you at the question and answer portion later. We will pause for a 15-minute break. So if you can come back at 11.15, I have 11 o'clock on my watch. We'll appreciate that. And we'll have uh, Professor Mike Murtaugh talking next. Thank you very much. <laughs>